if a function is continuous over some closed interval a, b, then it'll have the intermediate value theorem property. Meaning if we say the functional value at a is f of a, functional value at b is f of b, say f a is less than f, f of b, then if we just take any value that's in between those two values, for example, alpha, somewhere here, right? So is there some x whose functional value happens to equal to alpha? The answer is yes. So graphically, it's intuitively clear. As long as we draw a horizontal line crossing alpha, right? It's abundantly clear there has to be some x value that happened to be whose functional value happened to be equal to alpha, right? Because the function is continuous. So if the function is discontinuous, can the property of intermediate value still apply? The answer is sometimes yes, sometimes no. So let's say, for example, a function is a derivative function, meaning little f is a derivative function if it has some antiderivative, capital F, whose derivative happened to be little f over closed interval a, b. Then if we take any value in between those functional values, little f at both edges, then there is always some c in this open interval whose functional value happen to, happens to be equal to this alpha. In other words, little f takes all the values in between little f of a and little f of b. No matter if the little f is continuous or not. So I'm going to prove the first part in this video. And the second part I'm going to prove in a future video that is there's no discontinuous points of type 1 if the function is a derivative function, right? If it's a derivative fun function and if it's discontinuous, the only possible discontinuous points are of discontinuous points of type 2. Otherwise, it's going to be continuous, right? In the case of discontinuous, then the discontinuous points have to be type 2. And... Uh, in a future video, I will also discuss the relation between antiderivative and Riemann integrability using double theorem to show that if a function has antiderivative, it doesn't necessarily mean it's Riemann integrable. Likewise, if a function is Riemann integrable, it doesn't necessarily mean it has antiderivative. I'll prove that in a future video. But first of all, let me just use the gra this graph, let's say this is the graph of capital F and let's say this is A and this is B and this is the tangent line here, this tangent line at B so here the alpha is some general case now I'm going to consider a special case alpha is equal to zero, what will happen, right? so first of all again let's just use, so little f so capital F dash of x is equal to little, little f of x over the interval a, b. And I'm going to assume that little f of a is less than little f of b. And also little f of a is less than 0, and 0 is less than little f of b. All right, so. So alpha is zero, it's my special case. I'm gonna translate special case into this general case later. So first of all, then here's my claim. This is my assumption, here's my claim. So claim is there has to exist some C in this open interval so that little f of C is equal to zero. The reason is because, first of all, first of all, the definition of the limit, right, what's the definition of the limit? I'm, look, I'm going to look at point B, right? So as X approaches B, I'm going to let X approach B from the left-hand side. 
right here. So point B, X is at the left hand side, right, approaching B. So the limit of uh, capital F of X minus capital F of B over X minus B is equal to capital F dash of B, that is little f of B as our notation. Little f of B, like I said, we assume it to be larger than zero. Now, so the best part about limit is that when x is close enough to B, then this inside expression can also be close enough to f of b. In other words, this expression can also be strictly larger than zero. Right. So, you know, to put it in, into writing, so for any epsilon, I'm going to use a special epsilon. So, I'm going to use epsilon equal to half of f of b. First of all, is f of b positive? Yes, so it's okay for me to use that. So there is, has to exist some delta. So when x is within the neighborhood of b, deleted neighborhood, right, excluding b. So in other words, when the absolute value of uh, absolute value of x minus b is not only larger than zero and less than delta, less than delta. So I don't even need the absolute value. I just need the, because uh, x is approaching from the left-hand side. So meaning this is actually b minus x that is larger than zero and less than delta. Then we can always have the following inequality. Then we can always have the absolute value of f of x minus capital F of b over x minus b minus little f of b absolute value is smaller than my epsilon half of uh, little f of b now to get rid of the absolute value I have f of x minus f b over x minus b minus f b is less than half of fb but larger than negative half of fb. Right now I just need the left hand side. I'm going to plus f of b on both sides. Now capital F of x minus capital F of b over x minus b is now larger than just half of little f of b. Little f of b is of course assumed to be larger than zero. So now I've really shown that as long as x lives in this deleted neighborhood of b, then this expression is always strictly larger than zero. So since x is approaching from the left hand side, so therefore x minus b, x minus b is always negative because x is on the left hand side right so the bottom is always negative so the whole thing has to be positive so that means the top also has to be negative right negative negative positive so top is negative so f of x is less than f of b So the reason I'm doing this is because I want to rigorously show that f of b cannot be the minimum, minimum value here. Right? Likewise, likewise, f of x is smaller than f of a. Right? So in other words, capital F of a cannot be the minimum value. I want to show that. But from the graph, it's abundantly clear, right? So, since 
since the tangent line at point A, its slope is assumed to be negative. Therefore, obviously the functional value at A cannot be the minimum value over this interval. It has to be somewhere else, right? Minimum value cannot be F of, cannot be capital F of B, obviously, because just nearby B, there is already some functional value that's already smaller than f of b, right? So near this neighborhood of a, there is already some functional value that's smaller than f of a somewhere here, right? So obviously there is a some point, at least one point, for example, at this point, where the tangent line, its slope of the tangent line has to equal to zero, right? So little f of some maybe c, but we still have to write it down rigorously, right? From the graph, we can see this is obviously the minimum value, both the local minimum and the global minimum. But here we have to prove it rigorously, right? So <clears throat> this is for all the axes. That's near the neighborhood of B, right? B minus X is larger than zero, less than delta, right? For all the axis, axis, axis lives in this neighborhood, but this inequality applies to all the axis that, so X minus A is less than delta one, larger than zero, right? In this deleted neighborhood at point A, right? Point A, where X is on the right-hand side, right-hand side, a different neighborhood, right? Delta one. So nearby this point, right? So this is more rigorous. So therefore, therefore meaning the minimum value has to be taken somewhere else other than A or B, if it can be taken. So can we reach, can capital F reach the minimum value, right? The answer is yes, because f of x, capital F of x is assumed to be derivable. Therefore, it has to be continuous over this closed interval. Therefore, it has to be uniformly continuous. Therefore, it will definitely reach the minimum somewhere at point C. That's in the open interval, excluding both edges so that capital F of C is the actual minimum. Right, not just global limit minimum. So local minimum doesn't necessarily imply global minimum, but global minimum definitely implies local minimum. This is for sure. And also because capital F is assumed to be derivable, therefore the derivative at point C, denoted as little f of C, has to equal to zero. has to equal to zero. So, so I've proven the special case. As long as capital F satisfies the following conditions, then there is some C so that its derivative value is equal to exactly zero. Now, I'm going to translate it into my general case. Now I've proven my claim that as long as some function satisfies the following conditions, then this statement is always true as a special case. Now I'm going to let's just use G, right? Capital G dash of X is equal to, let's denote it as little g of X. Capital G is derivable over a, B, and let's just choose some random alpha. 
in between little g of a and little g of b. Without loss of generality, we can just, just assume that g of uh, a is less than little g of b. Right? We will just automatically, we, we automatically assume that little g of a does not equal to little g of b. Now, in this case, I want to construct a new function. Let's just construct perhaps h, h of x is equal to capital G of x minus alpha x. The uh, motivation, uh, perhaps I'll, I'll let you figure out the motivation. But this is a very common technique in analysis. First, we work out a special case, then we construct some other function, then translate it into a general case. So capital H of x is equal to, so is capital H derivable? Yes, because capital G is assumed to be derivable. And alpha x is obviously derivable. Therefore, capital H dash of x is equal to capital G dash of x minus alpha. And let's just denote it as little h of x as its derivative function. Right. So this is equal to G, capital G dash of, denoted as little g, little g of x minus alpha. Right, so all in all, I have little h of x is equal to little g of x minus alpha. Now, what is little h of a? Little h of a is little g of a minus alpha. Little g of a is less than alpha. So little g of a minus alpha is less than zero. What's little h of b? It's little g of b minus alpha. Right, we assume g of b is larger than alpha. Therefore, g of b minus alpha is larger than zero. Larger than zero. Now, in this case, this is my case of special case, right? So the derivative value at point A is less than zero. The derivative value of B is larger than zero. This is my special case. Right? Just using different notation. Here I use the notation of F. There I use the notation of H. So similar idea. Right? Capital F is derivable. Capital H is derivable. Little f of a, little f of b, right, squeeze, right, on the two sides of zero. Little h of a, little h of b on the two sides of zero, right, opposite side of zero. Totally satisfied. So therefore, according to my claim, there should exist some c in the open interval so that little h of c is equal to exactly zero. What is little h of c? Is equal to this. Little g of c minus alpha. Little g of c minus alpha equal to zero. Right? So in other words, little g of c is equal to alpha. Right? So meaning if Little g of x is some derivative function over closed interval. And also, we take any random constant in between little g of a and little g of b. Then there exists some c, that little g of c is equal to alpha. So I've really proven my general case, just using different notations. Just using different notations. Right here, I use f, there I use g. Similar idea. So, so I'm done with the uh, first part. 
Now I'm gonna prove it, prove that second point in my next video. Then all in all, when I'm done proving the double theorem, well then we can move on to prove my last theorem, which is there is no relation between antiderivative and Riemann integrability. So meaning if a function is has antiderivative, it doesn't necessarily mean it's Riemann integrable. If a function is Riemann integrable, it doesn't necessarily mean it's it has antiderivative.